Welcome to Hope Sabbath School, an in-depth, interactive study of the Word of God. We are in the middle of an amazing series on suffering and trials. You say, Derek, that doesn't sound very encouraging, but we're talking about suffering and trials with Jesus by our side, our comfort, our strength, and our hope. Our topic today, enduring extreme suffering. You say, that sounds challenging, and it is, but we'll find some messages of encouragement. So welcome to Hope Sabbath School. Welcome to the team. Good to be together again, isn't it? I've been so blessed so far in this series, and I'm excited today also because Jason's going to be leading our study. Jason, we're looking forward to an in-depth, interactive study of the Word of God. I also want to welcome some of our remote team members who are with us. Jonathan, good to see you here. Jonathan from Maryland, glad you're here. And Haiti joining us from Virginia. Haiti, great to have you back as one of our remote team members. And Sabina's joining us from British Columbia. Pastor Sabina, good to see you today. And we're just excited that we can study the Word of God together. We're also happy that you're here because you are an important part of our global Bible study. And we're happy to hear from you. Write to us, please, sshope at hopetv.org. I'm going to tell you in a minute about a free gift we have for you. We want you to get that, but we also want to hear from you because we want to hear how God's blessing you through a study of His Word. Here's a note on our Facebook page. We've got about 180,000 followers on Facebook, and Pamela writes from Ohio. She says, one of the things I really love about Hope Sabbath School is the interactive format. Mm -hmm. We get the bigger picture as others share what they've seen in a particular passage, and also they share their testimony as a relevant uh, addition to the week's topic. I really enjoy hearing from my brothers and sisters around the world. <laughs> Looking forward to a time when we'll be able to meet in person or when Jesus comes to take us home. Amen. 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 Pamela, thanks for writing to us. And we, we enjoy hearing from people around the world too, including you from Ohio in the U.S. Here's a note from Charles in Jamaica. And Charles writes and says, I've taught Sabbath school class for many decades, being a member of our church. It's been a great source of learning for me. Is that true? When you teach, you learn. Mm, yes. Mm. I've always enjoyed a good Bible study, and I appreciate the conversational, family-like setting of Hope Sabbath School. It really does bring people from all across the world. Let's just pause and look at each other for a minute. We don't all look the same, right? <laughs> we represent many different cultures because we're a global family. It brings people from across the world together in the most fulfilling exercise of all, Bible study. Amen. Amen. May God continue to bless Hope Sabbath School. Charles, thanks for joining us uh, from Jamaica. We're glad you're part of our Hope Sabbath School family. Here's a note from a donor couple in Virginia. Haiti, that's your territory down there in Virginia. The donor couple writes, says, please accept our donation for the continuation of your ministry. It's most appreciated. We enjoy the Bible songs too, and the different viewpoints brought up by the team members. We believe we are on heaven's doorstep. What do you think? Wow. Amen. Heaven's doorstep. It seems most appropriate to allow Jesus to wash our feet and prepare our characters for heaven. Mm -hmm. Amen. May we share the blessed message with others. And this donor couple sent a gift of $1,500 to bless the Hope Sabbath School ministry. Thank you, donor couple in Virginia. And thank you to each one of you. You say, well, I could, I could help with $5. Listen. Let's all be part of the miracle. Go to hopetv.org slash hopess. That's our website. There's a donate button. And say, I want to be part of sharing the gospel message with the world. We appreciate each one of you. One last note from Peter and Lorraine in South Africa. And Peter and Lorraine write and say, we're from uh, the south coast of South Africa. We thoroughly enjoy Hope Sabbath School study time. It helps us to get more information. Oh, so actually Lorraine's writing, getting more information when my husband, husband teaches a Bible class. 
Thank you very much to you and your team for a great study time. Well, I'm always excited to hear that people are starting classes and teaching the Word of God. You can go to our website and you can download the outline that Jason will be using to teach our class today and share it with all of your class members. And by the way, when you go to our website, we have a free gift for you. I'm excited. It's a collection of 12 songs called Songs of Hope. I've been so blessed to have a life companion who puts scripture to music, and I can hide that in my hearts. And we're giving away just this series on suffering and trials, a collection of scripture songs called Songs of Hope. First time ever on Hope Channel. You can go there, and it will include the theme song that we're singing in just a minute, Fear Not, For I Am With You, mm -hmm. and 11 other beautiful songs of hope. So don't forget, go to our website, hopetv.org slash hopess, click on the little free gift button in the middle of the screen, and you can get your 12 songs, and you have our permission to tell all of your friends. Go to a Hope Sabbath School website, and you can get the songs too. Right now, we need your help. Let's sing our beautiful theme song, Fear Not, For I Am With You. Let's sing it together. Mm -hmm. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. right hand. What a beautiful promise. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. And, and Jason, we especially need that in times of extreme suffering. So mm -hmm. thanks for leading our study today. Yes. Amen, Pastor Derek. We do. And before we begin the study, let's invite the Holy Spirit to be with us. Please bow your heads. I'm going to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, today as we open your word, as we see stories of those who went through some hard times, Lord, help us to take lessons so no matter what situation we find ourselves in, we know that you are there with us. Guide us in our lesson today. We pray in the name of Jesus, the one who is always there no matter what sufferings we have. Amen. 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 Well, as we've been looking through this lesson on suffering and trials, we've known, as Pastor Derek said, we don't go through it alone. God is there with us. But today, as we look at this idea of enduring extreme suffering, and we're gonna see some stories of extreme, I want us first to think about this word enduring. And so I wanna ask someone here on the team, when you hear the word endure or enduring, what comes to mind? Travis, what thoughts, what feelings, what do you think of when you think of the word enduring? Well, I was thinking of uh, trying to put a word to it, and I don't know if, it, uh, if I can even come up with a word to fit enduring other than to just go from point A to point B without stopping and just keep pressing forward. Mm -hmm. Point A to point B without stopping, pressing forward. Jonathan, yes. Yeah, I think of a marathon. You know, you start and you keep going and you're like ready to, to stop and give up, but you know you have so many more miles to keep pressing through. 
and uh, eventually your body can follows through. That's right. Uh, like a marathon, you keep going. Uh, Sabina, I think you had a thought there about this word endure or enduring. Jason, I also can only think of athletes. I have a sister. She really loves like triathlon. So she has to every morning she runs, she swims in the following day. And in the other one, she, um, you know, she bikes. So I always think of her and her ability of consistency in the very difficult routine. All right. I like that word there, consistency. And we're going to see if we find some consistency through the stories of today. But I want us to now go uh, and look at some stories. Okay, uh, Nancy, you had a thought here. Yeah, when Jonathan mentioned uh, the marathon, I thought that when people are running, there's people along the side that are encouraging them. Mm. And so we have God who's always with <laughs> yes. us. He will not let us fall. Amen. Amen. That's an important lesson. We aren't enduring this race alone. The extreme mm. suffering that we see today, even when it looks like some people might be alone, as Nancy shared with us, we're never alone. Now let's look at one of these stories. I'm gonna ask John if you could read for us. We're gonna look at the story of a man named Job. And if you could go to Job chapter one and read verses 13 through 19, John, let's look at what is this suffering that this man goes through. And then we're gonna talk later and read further about the background to the suffering. But as John reads, let's just look what is happening. What do we see on the surface? Job chapter 1, verses 13 to 19 from the ESV. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them, and the Sabians fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burnt up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people, and they are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Mm. Yikes. <laughs> Is that some form of uh, extreme suffering? What do we see there? What are some uh, things taking place there, Pedro? What do you see in those verses? Well, Job lost everything he had. Everything he had. What are some of those things he had, Nancy? Well, he had, he was very wealthy. He lost all of his wealth, but worst of all, he lost all of his children. He mm. lost all of his children. So all mm. of his wealth, all of his children. This is a sad situation. Now, if you were to just look at the text and what these persons are saying, who is the cause of this suffering? Who's the persons uh, making this suffering happen? If you're just looking at the surface, what do we see here, Nancy? Well, I kind of divided up the suffering and I saw that it said um, that human enemies attacked and they stole and destroyed. And then um, natural disasters came in the way of wind and fire and they destroyed everything and everyone. And then I was thinking, who comes to kill <laughs> and to steal and to destroy? There's a, there's a text in the Bible mm. in um, John 10.10, 10, and it's, it's, it says a thief. A thief has come to mm. steal, to kill, and to destroy, and that's Satan. Mm. Yes. yes but you know, Jason, if we just had the text, that's mm -hmm. why we need the earlier verses. They, they, they even describe the fire as the fire of God, God. Mm -hmm. and it isn't. If we read the context, the inspired text, because we believe Scripture is given by the inspiration of God, but uh, they're, they're actually saying it's either the, the Sabaeans or the Chaldeans, mm -hmm. either people or God. Or God yeah. and, and neither, well, maybe the enemy of our souls is even behind these mm -hmm. hostile forces that are coming and raiding and killing. That is right. And a lot of times, many people may believe that the uh, sufferings we experience are from other people or from natural forces, or yes, even the fire of God. But this story will give us a little bit of a hint into who the author of suffering truly is. And so Gladys, let's look here because let's see who the author of suffering truly is. 
Let's go back a few verses. We're in Job chapter 1 here. Read verses 6 through 12 because let's be clear here. Who really causes suffering? Is it other people? Is it natural forces? Let's see what the Word of God says. Sure. I'm reading from the New International Version, Job chapter 1, verses 6 to 12. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright man, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself, do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Mm. All right. Now, this is a unique story, and maybe not every situation applies, but we get some lessons here about the author of suffering or the origin of suffering. Travis, what do we see here in these verses that tell us about the origin of suffering? Mm. Well, first off, we see that Satan is trying to make, um, take and give God the blame for it as even trying to entice God to do it. He's like, I'm not doing that. That's not the character of God. But then when he does do it, he's trying to, to pin the blame on God so that Job will actually curse God. But unfortunately, or fortunately, it doesn't work out that way. And Job trusts the word of God and uh, realizes that uh, while he may be suffering, that he can trust in the promises of God. Mm -hmm. Jonathan? Yeah, I, I guess I, I I'm trying to struggle with with both and I think there's there's both ways you can look at it because on one hand yes it is the devil who comes and who incites God but he does say in verse chapter two which we'll read in a second that you incited me against him and so I I, I feel like that the issue is is not necessarily in this instance it seems very clear that the that the, the devil does it but I guess I'm questioning is the bigger issue the question, the challenge against God. In some cases, there's other things in Scripture where it seems like God doesn't necessarily put it in so much as the devil does it, but it is always, like Abraham, which we'll read, it is always a test of our, our trust in God. So it seems like that is the, the bigger issue to me. But yeah, Pastor Derek. You know, Jason, when you read this, you say, why would Satan attack a blameless man and, and, and not only destroy all of his possessions, but kill all of his children. That, that seems a very evil thing to do. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, we've been studying even earlier, I think in lesson two of this series, that, that Satan, once a covering angel, desires to usurp the throne of God, is cast out of heaven, and, and he is focusing on destroying everything, especially God's precious children. Right. So, you know, people read this and say, he, he, he's, he's mad, Satan is insane. He's, he's controlled by evil. And the answer is, that's right. Jesus said he's a murderer and a liar. And uh, it's just shocking to see how vicious mm -hmm. the enemy is. Mm -hmm. Travis. I just want to build on what, what Derek has said, and that is every person is the object of God's love. Mm. Every person. And so if we have a child, they're the object of our love. And when yeah. someone hurts them, it inflicts pain. Mm. Yep. So he inflicts pain yep. on the heart of God and the soul of God by, by hurting and destroying the object of his love. Mm. Yes. Sabina. Jason, something that uh, calls my attention also in this passage is that the enemy identifies that God is a blesser, that God's, God always has the best intentions towards his children. Not only he says that God had placed an, a hedge around Job protecting him, but he also says that Job is a blessed person. So I think that's a very interesting element of the story, just starting off 
with that clarity, even from the enemy, that it's not God who is intending to hurt or in any way um, even cause any suffering to Job or his family or his servants or even the animals. Mm, that's true. Thank you, Sabina. And speaking of this idea of a hedge, Haiti, if you could read for us, we're going to continue in the story in Job chapter 2, verses 1 through 9, because let's see what happens. Even when the hedge is not there, let's see what happens to Job. Let's see how Job responds. But if you could read chapter 2, verses 1 through 9, let's look at what happens. What does Satan do further to Job? All right. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And it says, again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth? a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil, and still he holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. So Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin, yes, all that a man has he will give for his life, but stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a potsherd with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Mm. Mm. We thought the suffering was bad enough mm. in chapter 1, but now Satan's not done yet. He's a father of lies, he's a murderer, and he wants to inflict pain. Mm. And so how is he afflicting additional pain here, Stephanie? What else do we see? Yeah, I see as not only physical pain, right, the boils, but also a spiritual um, attack. Mm. His wife, who is the one who is supposed to be supporting him, is saying, curse God and die. She's not helping him in, in this spiritual walk. She's struggling through this process That's as right. well. Yes. Uh, I appreciate you saying that, Jason, because I always used to think she's a bad lady. She told her husband, curse God and die. I think she's struggling. chronically depressed. She's just lost all of her children mm -hmm. and her husband is covered with boils. And, and of course, Satan always attacks weak people or people, I should say, in a moment of frailty yes. and weakness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I can't imagine looking back that she was happy she said that, but sometimes the enemy can, can drive us so low that we say things sure. that later we say, what was I thinking? And that's a part of enduring extreme suffering. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in the endurance part, there may be some faltering. You may slip during that marathon, but mm -hmm. the point is keep getting back up, keep moving through. Yes, Pedro. Mm -hmm. I see the aspect of relationship and commitment here. Mm -hmm. oh. Job was committed to God, and we see through the story, you know, we, we, that he was very committed to him daily for his children mm -hmm. and for himself. Mm -hmm. and, and we have this in, encounter here between God and Satan, and, and, in doing, and even though he's not aware it's happening, one of the important things, he's not aware that conversation happened in heaven. He just see enemy coming, see destruction coming, he sees sickness coming, and he says, what is our, this coming from? Mm. But he, he's like, well, I'm going to trust on the one that I have committed myself to mm. and have a relationship with him. So going back to the, our first question, endurance is a trusting covenant relationship. Mm. Mm. Amen. Jonathan, Haiti, and then we also have to look at Job's response. So Jonathan first here. Yeah, it's, it seems like it's a, a challenge of character. I mean, Job is challenging this relationship that God has with his people and saying, mm. it, this is just tit for tat. This is just... They don't really trust you. They don't really believe in you. They are just doing because you 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 protect them. You you know you're good to them, and so I, th I think it's it's really a, a bigger picture of this question of who God is and why 
um, people supposedly the devil would say, like serve him. Like it, it's are they do they truly believe in you? So I think it's a great controversy question in a bigger picture of of who God is and and whether God's government truly is this wonderful um, being that we serve out of love and trust. Yes, definitely. Satan is there accusing God, accusing us, and he is the one attacking. Uh, Haiti. Well, I was just going to say, Nancy a little while ago had spoken about the the analogy uh, of endurance, you know, being a marathon, or several people did. But she specifically brought out the point that sometimes you have uh, people on the sidelines encouraging you and cheering you on. And, and Job, instead of having someone encouraging him, comforting him, he had the opposite. He had someone discouraging him and bringing him down when he's there running and he's already been through so much. Uh, spiritually speaking, he's run so many miles and she's just bringing him further down. So I just see how the enemy will use every single instrument and weapon that he can to completely just break us emotionally, physically, in every way that he can. Mm. Mm -hmm. wow. Yes, and as we know from the rest of the story, we're not going to read it, but it's not just Job's wife. Everyone that Job seems to associate with, these friends, these other individuals, they aren't exactly the most encouraging either. <laughs> but yet, how can we respond when we endure extreme suffering? Mm. Stephanie, let's read Job's response here. Job chapter 1, read verses 20 through 22, and then also read chapter 2, verse 10. Let's see, right. how does Job respond to this extreme suffering? And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. Hmm. And then chapter 2, verse 10. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Hmm. Wow. All right. Wow, that's a lot. But what do we see there? How is Job responding to this enduring extreme suffering? John? You know, uh, the Babylonian literature and the Egyptian literature were contemporaries uh, during the time of Job. And there are similar stories, uh, just like Job, in those literature too. Mm. But what makes different about, you know, the Hebrew literature is the factor of God in the Hebrew literature. Uh, he began to at least get his grips to some extent because of the God factor that is found in the Hebrew literature, the God of heaven, uh, besides the other literature that we find. Mm -hmm. And so he was, because he had some understanding of God, he was able to, you know, had some grip. All right, Gladys. It was the relationship that Job had with God. That's right. He stood on his word. Mm -hmm. He didn't let the lies at the end, the, the, circumstances were putting in his mind, the doubt that his wife was, was bringing in to, to deter him from trusting in the God that he knew. And obviously by that statement in verse 20, 21, where it says, the Lord gave and the Lord taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. His response was worship mm. because he knew he, whom he had believed. Mm. Yes, and he even says, I know my Redeemer lives. Pedro. <clears throat> it's beautiful to see here that even though Job is suffering, God is suffering with him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God is ultimately, we're going to see here through our lesson today, is that extreme suffering, God is the one going through that mm -hmm. same process. You know, he's being hurting by, by his children. He's lost many of his children, was also his children, right? The children of Jacob, or Job was also children of God. Yeah. Right. The, the goods, he's attacking God's creation. Mm -hmm. yes. So we see mm -hmm. all that uh, endurance. And so even though the friends of Job in this world, even his family was not with him, the friend of Job God. was there and he trusted yes. him. Yes. Job's yeah. ultimate friend, God. Yes. Amen. Sabina, and then uh, we'll move on to another story. What's outstanding to me is that we have here the response of three different individuals, right? We have the response of the servant, who had attributed to God the fire from heaven, and we know it was not God's fault or God's 
um, power being used there. We also had the response of the wife, who is again, we saw cursing, asking Job to curse God. And then we have Job, Job's response to what happened. And I find it interesting that Job, he also didn't know who was the cause of his suffering and why was it happening. And it's even interesting that he says that it's God who is taking things away from him. I don't know if you observed that, but on verse, um, on verse, was it the verse three, um, 21, 21 that we just read? He's, he's attributing to God that nakedness and that lack of things that he's being exposed to. And we know it was not God who was doing so. Mm -hmm. And still, even though he didn't have a complete picture, and maybe his theology there, his understanding about God was still lacking, he, he, he relayed on his relationship with God. Mm. And he knew God was good. He knew God had been good to him and that God would not be able to do so. So even though he still has this kind of unclear picture of what's going on, he's able to worship God. And I think many times that's what happened to us when we go through trials. Mm. So I just want to applaud Job, even though he didn't have that clear picture from God, he was still worshiping him. That's right. Mm. Yes, and when we endure extreme suffering, we don't always know all the details, and right. God doesn't even ask us to know all the details. We trust him by faith, we hold on to that relationship, and by his power, he helps us endure. He helps us get through that Amen. suffering. And we know the end of the story. God does end up blessing Job. Job stays faithful. But now let's continue and look at another story. And I'm going to ask Travis if you could read for us. We're going to go to the book of Genesis. If you could read Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 and 2, because there's another man who had to endure some extreme suffering. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Mm -hmm. All right, so a little bit of background. Abraham was originally Abram, and he's had a fair share of trials in his life. He's had some times where he wasn't always so faithful to God. Uh, he had some uh, confusion. Uh, God made him wait several decades for a promised son. And now he's having a trial related to this promised son. Uh, and we say that this is probably the time of the greatest suffering that Abraham, a man who endured a lot of suffering, this is probably his greatest. Mm -hmm. Why is this his greatest, Gladys? Well, because like you said, he waited for decades for this son. This is his treasure. This is the one that God has said he was going to make him a great nation. And now it seems like God is contradicting himself, asking him to sacrifice. Imagine waiting for something for so long. And then God says, give it back to me. Yes. And not just give it back to me, but actually sacrifice, kill. This seems contrary to God's, God's character. character. Yeah. Yes. But let's keep reading through the story because we might see some lessons here. And uh, Jonathan, uh, if you could read for us Genesis 22 here, 3 through 8, and then we'll continue walk, talking more through the story. Let's see uh, Abraham's reaction to this, shall we say, strange request that appears from God. Can I just say really quick, I wonder if there was a backstory, just like the previous story. But anyway. All right, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Hmm. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took his hand in his hand, the fire and the knife. So they both went of them together, went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, father Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, 
God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. Mm. So they went both of them together. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. So what do we see here, Travis? How is Abraham responding to this call from God? Well, I think um, it's evident that he is trusting in faith. One of the things that he knew about his son is he for surely was the one which with the promise was to be fulfilled, that he would be the land of, or uh, the father of many nations. And he knew for sure that that was Isaac. But one thing I think that it's important to remember, we would probably ask the question, why would Abraham do such a crazy thing? But it was not uncommon in those days. Matter of fact, it was quite um, prevalent in the land that you would offer appease gods by giving your firstborn son. And you're going to see that God is showing, um, not only testing his faith, but proving that he's not like the other gods, that he's not asking for a firstborn son, that he's actually going to give himself. Mm. Gladys. What I like the most about this story is that Abraham didn't know how God was going to solve the situation. Mm -hmm. So he t trusted what he knew about God, the character of God. Amen. So he, that is where his faith really shone through, mm. the pain that he was going. Yes. Mm. Pedro. Oh, we see here, uh, I see uh, uh, two sides. We just saw Job when he was tempted by the enemy. The enemy is coming and bringing destruction, extreme suffering. But now God is bringing extreme suffering to Abraham. Now, one I see is because of jealousy and because of power, because Satan wants to happen. Now, God wants to build endurance in, 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 in Abraham. And even though we look into suffering, sometimes we look at God bringing, or the enemy bringing suffering, God also allowed things to happen in our lives so we can be a strength by His love. Derek. You know, one of the reasons, Jason, that I love Hope Sabbath School is because we study the Bible. Mm -hmm. Because you cannot understand this story fully without reading the rest of the scriptures. Yes. Yeah. You know, there is a text in, in 1 Corinthians that says God will not allow us to be tested mm. yeah. more than we're able to bear, yes. mm -hmm. but will with the test provide a way of escape. <laughs> that happens on Mount Moriah, right? right. Yes. yes. Uh, so God is doing it. But I also love in the book of Hebrews where it said that Abraham said, well, if God does allow him mm -hmm. to die, he's going to raise him back right. to life yes. again. Yes. That's right. So I think Abraham was obedient. He did offer up his son. Yes. Yes. He totally surrendered his son mm -hmm. to God. And of course, the beautiful rest of the story you'll read. But I'm so thankful for the rest of Scripture mm -hmm. that we can look at, which helps us to understand these Bible stories. Yes. And let's continue reading in the story. Pedro, I would like if you could read for us in Genesis 22. Let's read verses 9 and 10 because uh, Let's see, is Abraham actually going to go through with this act? Yes. I'll be reading from the New King James Version, Genesis 22, verse 9 and 10. And it says, Then they came to the place which God has told them. And Abraham to built an altar there and placed the wood in, the, in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his arm and took the knife to slay his son. Hmm. All right, so Abraham is about to actually engage in the action. Yes, Travis. So I'm sitting here thinking we're putting all this pressure on Abraham, but I'm thinking, what about Isaac? <laughs> he's the one getting killed. I mean, he's laying there. He surely could have overpowered his father, yes. but he's giving himself willingly. Yes. And I'm thinking, that's, that seems to me like he should be the one that we should be talking about. He's the one that's about to get a knife plunged into his heart. And so I'm thinking, man, we should have some <laughs> compassion on poor Isaac, you know? Yes, we should. But thankfully, even more than Abraham or Isaac, there is someone's compassion we're going to see here. And Gladys, I want you to read the rest of the story. Genesis 22, verses 11 through 14, because we have the immeasurable, unfailing love of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Mm. He's still okay. here. So let's finish the story. Verses 11, uh, 11 to 14, Genesis 22, New International Version. Mm. And he says... But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket, he saw a ram caught by his horns, he went over and took the ram 
and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. Mm. And to this mm. day, it is said on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Amen. All right. We must obviously have some lessons here. Travis, what do you see? One of the things that I'm thinking about, he says, God has not withheld your son, your only son. It wasn't his only son, but it was the son of promise. Mm. Yes. And yes. that's kind of a reflection of what God the Father did with Jesus, right? His only mm -hmm. son. It was, the, it was the gift that was promised way back in Genesis, that, he, that enmity would be put between her seed and the, and the, right. and the serpent seed. Yes. Pedro. It's beautiful how God wants us to learn that he's going to be taking up his the <laughs> extreme uh, suffering for us, mm. and we can endure with him. Amen. This is a, it's, sometimes we look into the lessons of God's uh, trials so we can go back and learn from his suffering and mm. says, yes, we can endure together. Amen. Amen. Sabina, Nancy, and then we're going to move on to another story. Sabina. Jason, I wonder if Abraham knew already the end of the story, if the suffering would be as extreme as we are discussing here. Wow. Because I see a big difference between what, what happened to Job, that actually Satan touched his life and made and caused like true suffering that was taking place there. People were dead. He was, he was sick. Whereas here we see that it just took a, a few span of time and then God came with what Pastor Derek was saying, that, that provision that was needed. Mm -hmm. So even in that way, I see like some big difference in between the suffering that was being experienced by Job, being caused by, by the enemy, versus what is this experience here of Abraham, which I'm not going to necessarily equate to what Job was going through. Mm. Yeah, and either way, it is extreme suffering. Yes. <laughs> no matter the, the source and all, and, and, and all the little details, it, it's painful either way. Nancy? Yeah. Mm. I, I feel so happy that um, Abraham, you know, was able to, to trust in God. Amen. Uh, because, you know, he went through other trials in his mm. life when he didn't. Yeah. In Egypt, mm. he lied, you know, to protect himself. You know, he, he lied about his, his wife not actually being his, his wife his half-sister, mm -hmm. um, then um, what other things happened with him? Um, oh, the son of promise, he, they, didn't, they, they waited so long and then they kind of gave up and said, well, let's help God out a little bit. And, and so then, then Ishmael came, but then this extreme, extreme test at the end, he was 120 years old and he was victorious because he had learned and God prunes us, doesn't he? He prunes us and he uh, helps us to build up our our faith in him and mm -hmm. he, he was successful. Amen. Amen. Yes, he does. And speaking of pruning, there's <laughs> another kind of fascinating story <laughs> where God allows one of his servants to be pruned. John, I would like if you could read in the book of Hosea, because we're going to look at the story of one of God's prophets, Hosea chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, because God calls his prophet Hosea to have, shall we say, a very unusual <laughs> form of extreme suffering that he has to endure. And as we look at this, just very quickly, let's see if we can take a couple lessons as we see this unusual story of this extreme suffering. Hosea chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 from the ESV. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take to yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. Mm -hmm. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Dibilaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Mm -hmm. All right, Stephanie, what is this extreme suffering that God is asking his prophet to endure? I'm, I'm not sure if I could really encapsulate it in one sentence, um, but I'll try. I mean, he's taking, he's asking him to take on a, a whore as his wife, which means she will not be honoring their marriage. Mm. And um, yeah, that's, that's deep, right? Travis. I'm thinking we, oh. we maybe could use another word, a prostitute, prostitute. Sure. because maybe around the world they don't know what a whore is, but, but this is a woman who's not faithful, like you said. Right. In fact, she's very unfaithful. Mm -hmm. Travis. I'm thinking so many times I talk to people who are in different situations, and they said, you just don't know what I'm going through. You just don't know my experience. And here, 
God is inviting Hosea, instructing Hosea, to go through a process in which he will experience the same kind of love struggle and struggle in life that he is with his bride or the church or his people. Mm -hmm. And so here the, he's getting a firsthand experience of what God is going through. And then God um, shows his immeasurable unfailing love. And well, we'll get to that. I'll let you go in the lesson. But it's, it's actually a quite beautiful story. Yes. And mm -hmm. speaking of his immeasurable unfailing love, Haiti, I would like if you could read about that here. Hosea chapter 3, read verses 1 through 3, because we're going to talk a little about the story, but there's something kind of unique that happens in how the relationship between Hosea and Gomer unfolds. All right, Hosea chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. I'll be reading from the New King James Version, and it says, Then the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel, who, took, who looked to other gods and loved the raisin cakes of the pagans. So I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and one and one half homers of barley. And I said to her, you shall stay with me many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man. So too will I be toward you. Mm. Wow. <laughs> what do we see there, Travis? That is this when I first understood this story brought tears to my eyes mm -hmm. because, you know, I, I realized, well, I, of course, I'm a man, but I realized that I was like the prostitute, right? Unfaithful to God. And he, although I'd been unfaithful and unfaithful, mm -hmm. here God says he's inviting me back into a marriage relationship with him. And it's like, wow, God, you're awesome. And it just actually brought tears to my eyes. And I thought, what a powerful story of God's love. Pedro Gladys, and then we got to look at another last story. Even though Jose is going through this uh, uh, extreme suffering here, the one that's going through this enduring process is God, mm -hmm. because he's using the prophet to tell the people what he is suffering. He says, you know, you cannot see me, but I want you to see through my prophet how much I love you and how much you have go away and slept with other gods that are made of wood and stones that have no relation to you and doesn't care about you. Mm -hmm. So sometimes suffering can be an object lesson, if you will, that mm -hmm. God's people, as they're connected with Him, He allows them to endure to show something about His love. Gladys. Yeah, I think that God loves visuals. You know, He's the greatest teacher. And <laughs> He showed them, you know, in the desert with the manna, with the sanctuary and everything. And in here, as you know, like in, in Psalm 23, when God's goodness and mercy is chasing after you, this is God's visual to the people of Israel. I am chasing after you. No matter what you're doing to be unfaithful to me, I'm chasing after you. Mm. All right. Well, we need to look because there's a testimony that another person, probably one of the men who endured the most suffering, uh, shares. And I would like to ask Stephanie if you could read that. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. And this man that I'm speaking of is the uh, Apostle Paul, if there's someone we want to talk about when it comes to suffering and trials and enduring extreme hardship, uh, he would definitely be one. So let's see, what does he say in his own testimony about enduring extreme suffering? And the New King James Version says, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Mm. Mm. Wow, we despaired even of life. All right, so what is Paul saying here? Why is this verse included? Nancy. Um, I, I wanted to say this, when, when Gladys was talking about, about our suffering and how God uses visuals um, <laughs> and object lessons, um, I heard a sermon once where the pastor brought out a long string like this that went all across the platform. And, and he said, you know, no matter what you are experiencing, this is eternity. And it goes on and on and on. And this right here is your life. And so um, we, we can hang on, we can hang on, we can trust in God. That's what he's trying to teach us, but we can also, um, have the assurance that it's only temporary and then we have the rest of eternity to spend with him. Amen. Yes. 
I'm thinking of a couple of examples because there's lots of them, but he was stoned once mm -hmm. and yep. they left him as dead mm -hmm. and, and he mm -hmm. was actually dying and then they came and prayed Barnabas with them and, and he stood up. <laughs> I think of him when he was shipwrecked, hanging on there in the Mediterranean, hanging on to probably a piece of driftwood and finally ends up on the island of Malta. There were many times that I, I imagine Jesus, I mean, imagine Paul praying what Jesus prayed, yes. Father, into your hands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think that's, that's what all of, I think that's what Job prayed, you know, mm -hmm. into your hands, God, mm -hmm. worship right. into your hands. And, and I think Job is just a great illustration that people who love Jesus and serve Jesus can still experience extreme suffering. Yes, yes. yes that's right. Mm -hmm. And yes, when you look through the history of the Apostle Paul, he went through so many different times. And yet he says here, I don't want you to be ignorant. I'm not going to cover it up. I'm going to be honest. And so that may be one lesson in enduring extreme suffering. It's okay to share. It's okay to say, yes, I'm struggling right now. But yet, Paul still has a further testimony. And so, Travis, I would like if you could read here in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, if you could read verses 3 through 5 and 9 through 10, and then I would like Pedro, if you could read 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10, because let's see, what is Paul's ultimate conclusion when it comes to these experiences of enduring extreme suffering? And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that we may be able to comfort mm -hmm. those who are in any trouble mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Mm -hmm. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then 9 and 10, Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. Amen. 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 And then Pedro, Paul says something just as powerful in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. Read that for us, please. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. And lest I should be exalted above measures by the abundance of the revelation, to a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a, me a messenger of Satan to uh, buffet me, lest I be exalted above, above measure. Concerning this thing, I plead with the Lord three times that it might be departed from me, and he said to me, My grace is sufficient mm -hmm. for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecution, and distress for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I am strong. Amen. When I am weak, then I am strong. Mm -hmm. Paul's telling us it doesn't matter. We may go through some really hard times, and yet God is doing something. He's making perfect even in our weakness. And I want to mm -hmm. ask if maybe is there anyone on our team who might have gone through something? Maybe you have had a little bit of extreme suffering. We just have a couple minutes, but is there someone on the team who would be willing to be vulnerable and share a little of some extreme suffering you might have endured and what God has done through that experience for you. Um, Gladys, I see you nodding your head. Well, um, I have gone through a lot in my life, um, different situations, but the most recent one I have shared with you guys about my, term, my tumor returning. And one of the things that I have learned through this whole experience is God's faithfulness mm -hmm. and the length that he will go through to show me that he loves me. Mm -hmm. And I was telling Pastor Derek that it's just like, when I think like I'm all alone, it's just like something, just mm -hmm. a divine appointment or text or mm -hmm. a, a song that comes up. The Lord knows that I love music. So he speaks to me through songs, mm -hmm. but his word, mm -hmm. that has been the, strongest foundation 
to keep me on the race and mm. trusting that he will be faithful. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise God has helped you go through extreme suffering. You said you had a tumor and it's returned. So you've gone through a lot of medical pain, spiritual pain, psychological pain. So, and you're here on our team. Amen. So these are not, these are not just Bible stories now for us. This is real life. Our sister Gladys on our team has had to endure extreme suffering. Mm -hmm. And I imagine others of us, mm -hmm. if we had time, would be able to share our own stories, our own testimonies, as Paul has shared here. And while we don't have time to read it, I would encourage you, mm -hmm. go to Isaiah chapter 43, read especially verses one through seven, because God has an encouraging message for you, Gladys, for you, friend, that are watching, a message of hope, a message that no matter what situations you are going through, uh, God is with you. Uh, Travis, do you want to respond to that? You have some thoughts as we've talked about this idea of extreme suffering? Well, yeah, and, and I guess I'll just share a really quick story, and that is uh, when I was 15, uh, I went through a pretty traumatic thing where I watched my dad, somebody tried to murder him. Mm. Um, the family was broke up that night, and um, I didn't see my mom for over, over a year, and uh, it was just... Uh, my dad was gone and 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 then i was just went away from church and away from god and i started to relate my experience with who god is and um, i thought is god like my dad or is god like my mom and i was really confused about who he was but through um study of the bible i started to realize that god is not like the people we face you know on earth not maybe not like our our earthly father, our earthly mother, that his love is unfailing. Amen. And not that my parent, I don't love my parents, and they both came to uh, Jesus, but, but uh, praise God for that. But I learned that I, he was somebody I could trust. Yes. Yes. And, um, and that really has changed my life. Amen. Amen. Wow. So even our brother Travis has also endured extreme suffering. Thank you, Gladys. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Travis, for sharing. And maybe you're even going through suffering right now, maybe you're going through an extreme trial, I want to ask you, ask the Holy Spirit to guide you, throw yourself into the arms of Jesus because he is there with you no matter what trial you are facing. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Jason. What a great study. You say, how could extreme Amen. suffering be a great study? And the answer is the awareness that the Lord who loves us with an immeasurable unfailing love is by our side. And, and thank you for teaching us today in this discussion that, that God suffers with us yes. because He loves us. Yes. And He will bring us through mm. that extreme suffering to a glorious hope, an eternal life with Him, where there will be no more pain or sadness or sickness or death anymore, a new heavens and new earth where righteousness dwells. Do you want to be there? Let's trust Him today, even in the midst of our suffering and trials. Father in heaven, what an encouraging message. We looked at some great people of God who, who suffered, and certainly Jesus experienced extreme suffering, but all chose to say, I trust fully in you, Lord God, and your unfailing love. May we do the same in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks for joining us for Hope Sabbath School. What a journey we're on. Don't forget the free gift at the website. Take the blessings you've learned and go out and be a blessing to those around you.